Welcome to the Sense Making in a Changing World podcast, where we explore the kind of thinking we need to navigate a positive way forward. I'm your host, Maura Gamble, permaculture educator and global ambassador, filmmaker, eco-villager, food forester, mother, practivist, and all-round lover of thinking, communicating, and acting regeneratively. For a long time, it's been clear to me that to shift trajectory to a thriving one planet way of life, we first need to shift our thinking. The way we perceive ourselves in relation to nature, self and community is the core. So this is true now more than ever. And even the way change is changing is changing. Unprecedented changes are happening all around us at a rapid pace. So how do we make sense of this? To know which way to turn, to know what action to focus on, so our efforts are worthwhile and nourishing and are working towards resilience, regeneration and reconnection. What better way to make sense than to join together with others in open, generative conversation? In this podcast, I'll share conversations with my friends and colleagues, people who inspire and challenge me in their ways of thinking, connecting and acting. These wonderful people are thinkers, doers, activists, scholars, writers, leaders, farmers, educators, people whose work informs permaculture and spark the imagination of of what a post-COVID climate resilient socially just future could look like. Their ideas and projects help us to make sense in this changing world, to compost and digest the ideas and to nurture the fertile ground for new ideas, connections and actions. Together we'll open up conversations in the world of permaculture design, regenerative thinking, community action, earth repair, eco-literacy and much more. I can't wait to share these conversations with you. Over the last three decades of personally making sense of the multiple crises we face, I always return to the practical and positive world of permaculture with its ethics of earth care, people care and fair share. I've seen firsthand how adaptable and responsive it can be in all contexts, from urban to rural, from refugee camps to suburbs. It helps people make sense of what's happening around them and to learn accessible design tools to shape their habitat positively and to contribute to cultural and ecological regeneration. This is why I've created the Permaculture Educators Program, to help thousands of people to become permaculture teachers everywhere through an interactive online dual certificate of permaculture design and teaching. We sponsor global perma youth programs, women's self-help groups in the global south, and teens in refugee camps. So anyway, this podcast is sponsored by the Permaculture Education Institute and our Permaculture Educators Program. If you'd like to find more about permaculture, I've created a four-part permaculture video series to explain what permaculture is and, and also how you can make it your livelihood as well as your way of life. We'd love to invite you to join our wonderfully inspiring, friendly and supportive global learning community. So I welcome you to share each of these conversations and I'd also like to suggest you create a local conversation circle to explore the ideas shared in each show and discuss together how this makes sense in your local community and environment. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I meet and speak with you today, the Gubby Gubby people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. My guest today is Andy Goldring, coordinator and CEO of the Permaculture Association of the UK. He has always worked in permaculture and has been central in activating local and global networks. Permaculture is his profession, his vocation and passion and applies it in all kinds of ways. Andy is also spending a lot of time these days on climate action and transition with a particular focus in his hometown of Leeds. It's my great pleasure to share this conversation with you today. Well, welcome to the show, Andy. It's really lovely that you could join me here. Um, For those who are listening, Andy Goldring is the CEO and coordinator of the Permaculture Association in the UK and have been doing that for, gosh, over 20 (laughs) years now. Quite some time, yeah. Yes, congratulations. That's an enormous commitment. And um, and in that time, you've taken Permaculture Association to, from strength to strength. And a moment, before we talk Lots about all help. sorts of things that you do in that work, I, I wanted to first ask, like, how did you get to permaculture? And, like, why, why permaculture? Because you've immersed your whole life in permaculture. I have. Well, I guess the kind of short story is I, – I think it goes back to probably something like 1984 um, in the Bhopal 
incident. You know, when all those people were were basically killed by irresponsible corporate behaviour. Um, and, you know, with devastating consequences still to this day. And I think that was probably the first time that I, I just had this kind of political awareness of the world. I was 14 years old. I thought, hmm, that's bad. That's really bad. And it kind of led to other things, like acid rain. I started finding out about Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace. And, you know, climate change wasn't such a big deal then, but, you know, you could just get this growing sense of things not working. And um, I, I just kind of didn't want to be part of that world, of that corporate world that was making things worse. So I guess my first, my, my teenage years were really defined by my no, you know, what I didn't want to do. And, and in, in a way, I kind of dropped out. I, I ended up deciding to make myself un, unemployable. So I, I did a, a sculpture degree, um, fine art at Leeds Polytechnic, which was absolutely fantastic. I loved it. Learned lots of skills. And um, I finished my course and I, I think by the end of the course, I thought I'm probably not going to be a successful artist just because I'm not really... I wasn't into the kind of whole selling yourself side of it. I, I like the art, I like the sculpture, but I didn't like the selling myself bit. Um, so I decided to give myself some time to find the thing I really did want to do. And a friend of mine said, oh, would you like to hitch down to London and see the director's cut of Blade Runner? I said, sure, yeah, I picked up my jacket, we got onto the M1, hitched down to London, saw the film, came out, and I was just going to uh, phone my girlfriend Julie at the time who's now my my lovely wife and um there's someone in the phone box because we had phone boxes back then and um I was, I was like I'm sure I know who that person is and they turned around and said I know you I know you from somewhere and um he said oh yeah okay well, well, I said come on let's go let's go and have a cup of coffee it was about 10 at night or something and he'd I said, you know, you look really tired. Where have you been? He said, well, I've just been, I've just come back on a 30-hour coach journey. I've been to an international permaculture convergence. I said, oh, what's permaculture and what's a convergence? So he, he kind of told me about it. And I thought, this is really interesting. This is really interesting. We had a great conversation. And then, I don't know, I probably slept in the train station or something and came back the next day or whatever it was. And I went, before I came home, I, I I went to the Waterstones booksellers and just said, what have you got about permaculture? I said, well, how do you spell it? And no, nothing. But they had something on the database. We had the designer's manual by Bill Morrison. So about four weeks later, it turned up. And then I just read it cover to cover, loads of notes. And I'm, I'm a kind of, um, I, think, I think it's called an external processor. So when I'm learning, I tell everyone about it because that's, what reinforces my learning is talking about it. So everybody knew that Andy Goldring was into this thing called permaculture. <laughs> so, so someone said to me about three months later, they said, oh, Andy, there's a, um, there's a course at Bradford University on environmental design and permaculture. You should give it a go. So I, I applied, I got a place, and it was probably the best funded course ever. I mean, it was just... It was kind of some government money left over from regeneration work in Bradford. And because of that, you know, it, most teachers in the UK kind of came and did a slot. And it was three months long. And so I met lots of people, had this fantastic introduction. Um, it was led by a New Zealand guy called Russell Withers, who was an env environmental designer. And I had no responsibility. I had no kids, I had no, you know, nothing I had to do. So I, I've just been involved ever since that point, really, really from really from the moment when I said international permaculture convergence, what's that? I'm really I can we just take a way, bit of so a step just... back because you said there was a course at a university that included permaculture way back then. Yeah. Wow. That's so phenomenal. It, it is, and I think it's um, I mean, this is I think that was due, due to a um, Andrew Lankford, who I don't know if you've interviewed, but Andrew Lankford had done a course, had been cultivating various relationships with different councils and different institutions as part of his pioneering work in permaculture. And he'd cultivated some relationships in Bradford Council 
and taken people around to see various different projects. So when the City Challenge money came, they said, oh, opportunity for regeneration, let's do a permaculture project. So we just did this project called Springfield Community Gardens, which was absolutely brilliant. And it's a beautiful design. Andrew Lankford kind of turned up with his camper van. He was very open in a sort of very participatory design process. You know, this is a quite a tough white working class estate. He'd stay on the estate with um, local people, um, got the bunyip out to kind of get kids to help do the water level and all that kind of thing. So he developed that project. And in the process of that, more people in the council got involved. A guy called Jamie Saunders, who's into permaculture, you know, does permaculture, but has been really with Bradford Council probably since 94, 93, something like that. So when they had a bit of money left over, they then had some relationships within the university and they said, come on, why don't we do this course? So yeah, it's a really strong story of how important it is to cultivate relationships. I think outside of our usual circles, I think that's there's, we've got a lot of allies out there we don't even really talk to. Yeah, and that's a good example that's of that. Such a such a big point, and you know, I think that's really where we need to all be working right now, isn't it? That in order to for us to address the challenges that we face at the yeah. scale that's faced, it's only through the collaborations between them, which is something that you really work a lot on with with your work. Do you want to maybe talk a bit about some of the programs that are that are happening um, within the Permaculture Association now? Well, I might I might go beyond the association if that's sure. right. So, just I think um, so. So, I mean, action needs to happen at different levels, and we and we've got different aspects of our lives, haven't we? You know, so there's our kind of personal life and and the work that we do, um, you know, in our home and garden. So, I, I live in a Victorian terraced house and um, got a tiny little garden. We've got an allotment uh, where we do most of our veggie growing. Um, but on the street, you know, we cultivate our relationships and, and share plants and kind of, um, you know, have uh, have a discussion about kind of what's important in the world. Uh, so those kind of relationships are really important for me. Um, then in Leeds, I'm, I'm now involved in a project called um, the Climate Action Leeds Programme, which is part of Our Future Leeds, which is... Uh, two and a half million pound five-year program to develop a zero carbon, nature-friendly, socially just leads by the 2030s. And I wanted to bring that one in because it's a really interesting example of where we've managed to bring a whole host of different organizations together. So we had about 40 organizations that worked together to put a proposal to the lottery. We're very lucky in this country to have a, a lottery. I think it's one of the biggest kind of funders in the world. Uh, and they're, they're investing in climate change. So we've got this partnership together. It's now being delivered by, you know, five or six kind of main partners. And in that, we're, take, we're working with different communities. So there's eight communities uh, in different neighbourhoods, but then also at a kind of city level. Uh, and my job there is to create a, um, a city hub wow. where we bring bring people together to do participatory planning for the future. How exciting. My, my, my kind of goal is to do a permaculture design for Leeds. Wow. So I, th I think what's interesting there is, again, because I've, I mean, I, I'm quite a loyal person. I think because I moved around so much as a kid, um, you know, I, I'd be somewhere and then we'd go to my dad's next job and then go somewhere else the next job. And I, I, I kind of never just get to know people and then, you know, I, I'd leave. So when I got to Leeds, I thought, you know, no one's making me leave. <laughs> so I've been here since 1989. And that kind of embeddedness, actually starting to put your roots down and really connect. I think that's so important because it, 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 it means you, those relationships make things possible. So things in the 90s, when we were talking about local agenda 21, and with those that sort of wave of environmentalism, all those people I still know, and we still we haven't gone away. And then you've got obviously this youth strike and the big new influx of energy um, in the last couple of years. We've able to combine that, so we've combined that kind of older generation, the grey-haired people like me, with the young generation, with the the people with the, the new energy. 
but also recognizing that there's there's interest and not just interest but that you know the council is committed businesses are committed civil society is committed we're bringing in the whole kind of social justice and black lives matter angle on not angle but you know um important aspects of the work into it and and really trying to create a, a, a project where we can think differently about the city actually we're going to change the goal of the city that's our that's our goal is to change the goal Mm. We we want us because Leeds is very much a money city. So so there's that work in Leeds, and then that then becomes quite an interesting case study for what we can do in permaculture. So in the Permaculture Association, we're but there's what are we doing? There's there, there, we're doing all sorts of different things. I guess there's work to make permaculture more accessible. So that's about both from a kind of communications perspective, how do we reach more people? but also from an access perspective of what are the barriers that stop people being involved. Mm. So a barrier might be, um, uh, it, it might be they just don't think permaculture is something they'd be interested in because, you know, that's, that's uh, aren't you all white people? You know, so there might be, be barriers of ethnicity or, or cultural barriers. There might be barriers because people can't access events because they're low income. So there's financial barriers. There's all sorts of different barriers. So we're trying to understand what they are and work with people to um, overcome them. So that's about making it accessible. We want to accelerate learning about permaculture. So try and find different ways for people to learn about it. So we've started some more online learning. Um, and the events side, I think, is quite important, although there have been less events recently, obviously. But... Um, online learning the events um, is, is kind of quite a key part and we've got an educators group um so we're trying to bring you know, i think we've got about 95 educators that are working together to think about how they can support each other and develop their develop their, their work locally and and online um then we've got the the, the third objective is about growing networks so we, we've got something called the land network which um Land was just, you know, you know, if you want to get funding, you'd normally have to have a great acronym. So land was like learning and network demonstration. So it was recognizing that people learn really well by being practically involved in things. Mm -hmm. It's about celebrating the practical side of permaculture. So, and, and you've got quite a network of those land centers, I understand, around the UK. Yeah. But also beyond now too. That I know well, we were talking a while about getting some land centres set up in um, in Africa, and and we've got to the point now that those centres exist. And I would love to well, kind of amazing. connect in. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I think it's one of our really such a strong point about permaculture, isn't it? There's there's, there's so many theories about what things, how things can be, and then permaculture is doing it, and it has the theory as well. So it's it's a great combination. Yeah, I mean that's probably the most exciting thing for me is is the fact that that land spread and we didn't try we didn't force anything, we we just had a project we we created some criteria. It's really quite straightforward. All we're saying is, if it got to the point in the UK where someone someone would phone up and say, "Hey Andy, um, or hi, we're interested in permaculture. We've got a, a busload of kids to to." to take to a permaculture project, what would you recommend? And there comes a point where permaculture is growing there, where one person's kind of mental picture of what's going on isn't enough. Mm. And, and you really need a much more systematic approach to not just knowing which projects there are, but which projects you could confidently recommend to a school teacher. That's right. So there's a difference between someone running a permaculture project, I mean, lots of people are doing that, which is fantastic, but but some of them are set up specifically with visitors and volunteers in mind, mm -hmm. with that kind of public outreach side. So the land centres is much more focused on the, not just doing great permaculture, but doing great permaculture in a way which can engage, engage visitors and volunteers. So it's got that public outreach angle. And yeah, but it's a, it's a it's a growing group. We we had some good funding for it um, a few years ago. We haven't had any since really, but it's 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 mostly held its own. 
and um, certainly the number of projects are increasing. We, we need to kind of rejig our accreditation system, I think, to make it a bit simpler. Um, but yeah, it's really exciting. Men, that was picked up by Kat Deleris in Denmark, who, another brilliant pioneer. Um, she's then spread it to various parts of Scandinavia. I think the Germans are doing it. I think, um, I'm not sure which other countries in Europe. We've now got a, a, an EU funded project which is helping to spread that in different European countries. And then Steve Charter, um, who's a, another brilliant, dynamic, pioneering guy. Um, he's been with the IPEN, International Permaculture Educators Network. He's really invested in putting some money into various projects in other parts of the world. And I mean, that for me is just so, so important that we, we see ourselves as a really global movement and, and start acting together as a global movement. Because, um, you know, UK, we're pretty rich in lots of different ways. We're blessed in so many ways. Um, healthcare system, education system, um, huge wealth based on kind of empire and it's it's our duty really to share our abundance and to not impose anything but to work with and and to share and to learn I mean the, the learning that I've got I've been very very fortunate I've been to various international convergences and the learning you get from people that are working in you know say Padma and Nasana in Iranian agricultural alternatives you know, people people say, "Oh, Andy, Permaculture Association is so well organised." You know, you've you, you've you, you've got the most whatever. And I say, "Well, yeah, I have. Maybe it's okay. It's good." But actually, you've seen what they're doing in India. They've got seventy thousand women in seventy villages. That's seriously cool. You know, what they're doing is way beyond what we're doing. So, so really, we've got different strengths in different parts of the world. And I think if we could somehow link them up. We'd, we'd, our potential could just really increase. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and you're right too. I mean, looking out beyond our own, you know, by regions and beyond our own sort of nations, that that we start to connect as and see that permaculture is this myceliating network globally, and that that it, how it manifests in every different part yeah. of the world is. Um, finding its strengths and just rooting itself there it's amazing yeah. you know seeing what's happening for example just um, in the refugee settlements in east africa at the moment it's yeah. it's just phenomenal so yeah yeah it's like wherever you look i kind of think about you know when you lift up the log in a forest and you see all those mycelial <laughs> threads it's like wherever you go to any community and you lift up the logs you'll find these threads reaching out it's just Phenomenal. But, um, as well as the land centres, I know that you've been doing um, a work around collecting research. Do you want to share a bit about that? Because I think this is so important. There is so much research that happens about permaculture, but it's really hard yeah. to find it. You know, like it just is, it gets sure. stuck on someone's shelf or in a, you know, I, I would love to find out more about this personally as well. Yeah. So, so I guess... It's a funny thing, isn't it, research? I mean, to a certain extent, I had a kind of mental block. And I think a lot of people maybe have sort of this similar, similar thing. I mean, research can always seem like, you know, it's presented with, the, you know, men in white coats and it's all very, you know, high, high fluting, big tech. It, it somehow can seem quite remote, the idea of research. Um, but really, it's just a form of learning. And there's actually quite a few um, approaches. It's, it's not a single approach. And actually, with some fairly simple tweaks, we're kind of all doing research. It, we, 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 we've got those research capabilities. It's just a few simple tweaks which enabled us to, to kind of turn that into something that you can share in a way which is as sort of valid from a scientific method perspective. So, I mean, even stories are valid. I mean, there's there's lots of different research approaches. So, so I think when I when I sort of realised that actually research is just a kind of advanced form of learning. Well, if if permaculture wants to be really kind of pushing forward, then it's got to be learning. It's got to be learning. I mean, you know, we can't just rely on what 
Bill wrote in 1984. You know, it's, it's got to it's got to keep moving because we're the world's changing and we're learning new things and the world's learning new things. So that ability to learn is so important. And I, I kind of I'd always thought of the Permaculture Association as being an education led organization and that's still very much the case but really for it to be great quality education you need to put research in even advance of that because then your education is based on sound knowledge you know good evidence great case studies some people like numbers mm. don't they I mean love, some people are totally happy just to listen to the stories and other people say yeah but what are the numbers how do you know that you know like compost bins you know do, do they create more methane that go to the atmosphere? Are they are they the worst thing we should be doing? Well, we need to check. Actually, you know, and so that, that and that we keep on researching. You know, that and we've got to keep on researching. It, it keeps moving that information, and different yeah. different ideas so, come through, and different fields of knowledge are also threaded into the work that yeah. we do. And and That's and, right. that, and and you know that kind of keeps it absolutely exciting and fascinating for those of us who've been in it for decades already. Yes. That it is. It is not this static thing. It's not just this set curriculum. Well, there is a curriculum, but the the structure within that keeps shifting and yeah. changing because Absolutely. of it's a living. The information is a living system too. I find. Yeah, mm. it is, and, and and I mean, I think in terms of our research. So, so just to try and answer your question, I guess we've had a research coordinator. We don't have at the moment because, you know, people. Well, we don't don't have capacity. Basically, that's we've not been able to, to to continue that. We've got researchers, uh, but we haven't been able to put as much effort in recently. But we have got we've developed a research handbook, um, a research digest, which has got hundreds and hundreds of um, things that we've collected. So that's still available. Um, we, we we are doing research, but it's more incorporated in in other areas. So we don't have a kind of formal research coordinator as such. Um, there's a group called the Permaculture International Research Network, which is sort of re reigniting, and I hope we can get some more energy behind that. Um, and, and we've got people like, say, Coventry University. So uh, Coventry is called CAWR, C-A-W-R, the, gosh, what's it going to be? What's my, the acronym? Um, oh, gosh. I'll come back to the acronym of CAWR, C-A-W-R. Anyway. There are some now some universities with quite strong permaculture focuses. So that's that's quite useful to know as well. So when you say that, does that mean you can actually do like an undergraduate of permaculture at these places or is it that they have subjects within it? How does that work? What does it look like? So at Coventry, they have had people doing permaculture studies as but as PhDs and master's students so it's more it's not a Research. course in permaculture but it's yeah. something they've they've looked at who's the supervisor main supervisor there that keeps that do you know who that is oh uh, there's a there's there's a whole host of people so um the the, the overall director is Michel Pimbel um and then he is joined by Julia Wright who's both of them long-standing permaculturalists uh, Georgina McAllister, um, yeah, there's, there's a there's a there's a team of them there. Yeah, um, there's a guy called Dennis who did my course in Leeds. Um, so yeah, there's a good there's a good group of hmm. permaculture trained people at Coventry University, and their their research program is continuing. It, so that that's really good. Hmm. Um, what else to say about research? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the key things that's, that's, that we haven't quite got to yet, but I feel is really strong is that if you look at the, the design process, so, you know, starting with observations, surveys, observations, get your goals sorted, do your analysis, do the design, implementation, maintain, maintenance, then you've got the evaluation and the monitoring, and then the sort of tweaking it. There's a kind of process that, maybe it's different in different parts of the world but certainly in the uk we, we advocate a design process it doesn't take much to turn that into a research process mm. so all that all that initial survey information is your baseline data so you know when you when you're doing that first survey work 
taking photographs, looking at what the soil's like, um, doing the measure of biodiversity, maybe recording how many people are working on the farm, whatever it might be. That's all your baseline data. So in a way, what we've got is we've got this global network, a huge global network of in situ experimentation. And it's not that much of a tweak to suddenly create this huge database of uh, research evidence. We could be describing permaculture then as a, a massive network of citizen scientists. Absolutely. And, and yes, and I think that's a really important uh, little phrase there. It's not just it's, it's not citizen science. It's citizens. But what we really need is citizen scientists. Because mm -hmm. what often happens in citizen science is you collect the data for someone else. So you collect the data for, um, you know, a bird organisation. It might be just a second. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Impromptu, impromptu coffee has arrived. Oh, Thank wow. You. Um... <laughs> <laughs> you want one too? So, yeah, a, a lot of citizen science is essentially you gather data for other people. And I think what we really need is we need to become citizen scientists because then the data we gather can be for other people as well. So we can aggregate our data and start to see what's the trends and the patterns in our wider networks. Um, but it, it's got meaning for us. Mm. That's yes. what's so important. When we get the data, we go, ah, that soil method we tried worked. I'll do more of it. Or mm, actually, I've just created, I, I, I've just got lots and lots more slugs. <laughs> so, <Yeah. I'm> okay. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, that's the important bit is that we, we build, build a research approach which is, um, builds people's own capacity. And then them. to, then around that, creating these sort of communities of practice, because, you know, I, I see permaculture very much as a practice yeah. as opposed to yes. like a thing. It's It has movement. It's constantly evolving, developing. And yeah. when we create a community practice where we're learning together, you know, it's like, oh, Absolutely. I've just been trying this and this happened. What do you reckon? And so that's kind yeah. of the what I've been trying to integrate into the sort of work that I do that we have this, you know, you're not alone just trying to work it out yeah. by yourself. And this Absolutely. is, I guess, where, you know, things like the Permaculture Association come into play, but also in in sort of smaller hubs where people have this, you know, daily connection with each other in a way yeah. that there is this sense of this ongoing learning. And each time yeah. we hear from someone, it could be from the other side of the world as well, but, you know, different Absolutely. people are well, experimenting right. with different things and find different yeah. bits of information. Mm. So I think the communities of practice is really important. I mean, we've we've been um, involved, we are involved in a project called BLAST, which is blended learning, um, blended learning for the socio-ecological socio transformation. I mean, basically, it's about adult learning. <laughs> um, I can never remember. Acronyms. You've got so many wonderful acronyms. <laughs> There's so many acronyms. I didn't invent that one. And it, 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 it changed a couple of times. Anyway, BLAST all about blended learning but it's so mixing online and in person but mostly the key is about really setting up communities of practice because mm -hmm. that's one of the key ways that you can develop transformational learning is people learning with each other and inspiring each other so i've learned a lot about what it takes to maintain a kind of community of practice it may be more the more sort of formal end of it not formal but that may be more organized end and they're so powerful. You know, you can really get so much change and so much progress uh, and development from working with each other in, in a fairly s simple format. I mean, at, at the local level, you know, there's kind of little action learning guilds or just support circles or working bees, or I think so much of it can kind of happen very, really quite informally. You know, get a group of friends together and say, let's Let's all learn how to do an allotment or whatever it might be. And that can be quite straightforward. I think when you get to the kind of global level, then it needs curating and you need someone who's going to make sure that the Zoom link goes out and everyone knows how to use the technology. And, you know, there's other aspects to it. But but yeah, I think it's a really powerful way and it really suits. It, I think it suits our kind of vibe. 
of permaculture. Yeah, it does. Um, I think so too. And I, yeah, yeah. and I really like this way of learning because it gives us a chance to have some input, some formal input, and then a chance to go and practice it wherever we are and then to come back and then to toss around the ideas and then get more input. And like you're saying, it's this blended learning. You know, yeah. I've, I've had the same experience. It's it's such a powerful thing and yeah. um, gives a chance, you know, to really have that experimentation in there that it's not yeah. just sort of go and do a, a course. You know, I've done that for decades as well and I, I still love those courses, but there's something about this way of learning that I think, yeah. oh, I don't know, goes, it, it's, well, it's it supports the lifelong learning approach, I think, is really yeah. what happens, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this takes me back to a kind of quite in, important piece of reading that I did, which was, I don't know if you've ever come across um, Ivan Illich, mm -hmm. but he's a, he's a kind of South American, um, well, he was South American kind of radical priest. And um, he wrote a book called De-Schooling Society. I remember, yeah. And uh, De-Schooling Society Chapter six, it's the, the, the best description of the kind of future education system that I, I feel like I'm working towards. Um, where there's there's learning everywhere, learning all throughout your lives. Um, learning isn't just happening in an institution, it's happening in the community, it's happening in shop fronts, it's happening, you know, everywhere really. And in that, you know, he talks about you need you need places, you need pla things to learn from. So that could be a place, you go to a demonstration centre, you go to a demonstration farm, you learn in a, in a place or by the objects. You need, need the, the, um, the kind of the books for concepts themselves. You need some guides and some um, teachers, but mostly you need each other. Yeah. You know, you need each other. It's, fact, it's for other people that also want to learn together, which is the most powerful side. And I think... At the moment, we've got this, well, we've got such a huge transformation needed in society. If we could find a way to help groups of people to learn with each other in that kind of peer-to-peer -peer manner around permaculture and the related areas, that kind of, it's a learning revolution in, in a way is almost what's needed for me. You know, it's, it's because it's, it's, we just got to find new habits. You know, instead of chop, chop, chop into the bin, it's chip, chip, chop, chop, chop into the compost bin. Yeah. It's it's not necessarily that difficult or complicated, but it is a habit to change. It's something to learn. And and that those changes, those habit changes, they're so much easier if your friends are doing them. Yeah, that's right. So I wonder too, I'm just, um, I, I remember hearing from... Um, Lachlan McKenzie about the 52 climate actions oh, yeah. program so is this also part of this uh, uh, reason I'm thinking of that was because it was lots of little actions that people could yes. tangibly take That's and then right. maybe do with others in a community learning environment and yeah. uh, address the multiple issues that we're facing particularly around climate change do you want to just tell us a yeah. bit about the 52 climate sure. actions because i think it's a great tool for communities to pick up it is really good and, and and it does come from that piece of psychology which is it's you know understanding kind of behavioral science which is that a lot of people feel quite paralyzed by oh climate change it's enormous what can i do and actually finding a simple step people that have taken a simple step towards something are more likely to make another step mm -hmm. and people made two steps are more likely to make the third and then bigger ones and a whole process of change so whilst we absolutely recognize that climate change is a systemic issue and you know there's 70 com uh, 70 companies which produce the majority of fossil of climate change gases and you know we need to tackle the fossil fuel giants um absolutely we also need to change our own behavior for all sorts of other reasons too including our health and our well-being so what we did was we looked at well what are the what are the simple steps that people can take and actually for each of the 52 climate actions there, there are kind of three different levels so one might be um you know plant a tree so plant a tree might be something you can do yourself in your back garden and give some advice on how to do that but then there's a, a community action so the community action might be 
you know, create a community forest or a community forest garden or a community orchard. So there's a community level action that goes with the less simple action that you can take. And then there's a kind of more campaigning action. So it might be join the Woodland Trust or get involved in a national tree tree planting campaign. So, so it, it's couched in here's a really simple thing you can do, but it makes it really clear what the bigger things are that you can do as well. So and very easily scalable actions, too. It's really yeah. about 170 actions. They're all evidence-based. So again, this was application and research very well researched really nicely put together lots of activities that people can do and it, it's a bit like we, we don't we talk about permaculture in it but we it's not the it's not the headline mm. so all the partners involved were permaculture um ists <laughs> permaculture people um but we, we've chosen 52 climate actions because it's accessible it's directed to the point and it's a way in for people to permaculture yeah so we've we've, we've had a couple of experiments with that we, we had a, a campaign called we love living for a while and we love living you know we love living so we create forest gardens and you click on the link and then it takes you to permaculture association so yeah because the word permaculture can be a block for people as well when, when, when we don't know what it means so yeah finding other ways to, to draw people in to our web <laughs> I wonder. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, where you see the permaculture network or permaculture in general uh, addressing climate change. I mean, we, there's programs like Fifty Two Climate Actions, but where are you seeing, particularly in the UK, like uh, permaculture and climate action meeting? Is there are they sort of one and the same? Are they sort of What's the response that you're seeing from the broader permaculture community to address the climate um, climate change and to follow on from yeah. the climate strikes from September yeah. 20, you know, like the particularly around that that time, was that 18 months ago or so now? Yeah, I know sure. that it's, the world has changed a lot since then. but <laughs> It has. Mm. Gosh, it's, it's such a big and complex challenge. I mean, I think... We, we know that people that do permaculture have got smaller eco footprints and we've got some research from there's a Pilkington um, piece of research by a Professor Pilkington down in Exeter. We, we found that some of the lowest eco footprints. Well, what, what he found was that people living in eco houses that hadn't got training in permaculture had a bigger environmental impact than people living in normal houses that did permaculture. Hmm. So what he concluded was that the, the way to retrofit houses is to train people in permaculture. Interesting. So, so basically, it's like if you've got unskilled people in, in high-tech houses, it's not as effective as high-skilled people in low-tech houses. Because so that's the retro-suburbia idea, really, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly, way? exactly, yeah. So but there's no doubt that permaculture as a, a practice and as a sort of systems thinking and design approach, philosophy and worldview, so to speak, that all of that kind of combines into making us um, have a much lower carbon footprint, um, higher positive impacts in terms of biodiversity, and frankly, more resilient to shocks. You know, mm -hmm. so permaculture is clearly a really powerful way of addressing climate, biodiversity, and, you know, other kind of existential threats so more people doing more permaculture has got to be a really important goal how we achieve that then i guess is really is is the interesting issue so it's like the personal action stuff is fine so that's got to be done community action i think there's a lot in the uk for example there's a lot of um, interaction between transition network and permaculture so some of transition groups were effectively kind of rebranded permaculture groups or people that have been doing permaculture were kind of central players. So there's, there's a lot of collaboration there. Um, that's also true with other, other similar sorts of initiatives. So, so you know, um, where towns or villages have taken some kind of action, often there are people in permaculture that are behind that. So I think when you get to that next level of kind of community or town or city level work, it's not so much that we have to call it permaculture, but it's about bringing the ideas and helping to kind of co-create and co-design a project. Um, 
And then, you know, even at the global at the global level, I mean, I think the thinking is still totally relevant, but the, the action, I think, is, is bioregional, really. I mean, the, to me, the, 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 we can take, we've got total control over our homes and gardens, more or less. We've got some control and can co-create in our communities. We can participate at the city and the bioregional level. And, and that's where we can have real influence. At the kind of national and international levels, it, it, it's very hard to see how such a, a self-organizing, um, not very, not centrally organized group such as permaculture can have much political influence other than to infiltrate all the other institutions. So I would say kind of infiltration, I don't mean this in any sort of sinister way, but, but it gives, it's, I don't know what the other word would be, but to, to, to move into other institutions and, and to see how they can start to adopt permaculture and related approaches is really powerful. And, you know, I was thinking about it, Regen Ag is really getting big in the UK. Here too. You know, re regenerative agriculture is getting big. And I can't help feeling that actually Darren Doherty coming over, the first course was read, led by um, Aranya, permaculture designer. He, he brought Darren over. Um, I was the first person to bring Alan Savory over to do holistic management grazing. And, you know, everyone's talking about agroforestry and regen ag now. Now, we're not talking about permaculture. And even Regen Ag, I think, to some extent, has sort of maybe potentially lost some of its uh, connection with permaculture. But those ideas are out there, and that's fantastic. Mm. You know, so I think it is about seeding, seeding ideas. I wonder ideas, why you think, approaches. why is it that something like holistic management or Regen Ag can take off and permaculture stays, like, incrementally moving itself through the community in this sort of gentle way? I think, I think permaculture is fundamentally deeply radical. And that's great. You know, it really is. It's, it, I mean, a different... It, no, no so, so, yeah, so I think permaculture is deeply radical. We want an earth care, people care, fair shares future. That is not corporate capitalism. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a completely different economic model. Yeah. It's it's a it's a different political model. You know, we, I guess I, yeah, you can probably still do regen ag within that structure, can't you? Of but, you can. but within permaculture, well, there's there's a deeper. I mean, I think you could, yeah, go ahead. I think you could still do permaculture in that structure, mm -hmm. but I think there's part of it's branding, part of it's maybe about how do we demystify it, um, and part of it maybe is that it's okay. If we're at the edge, maybe that's all right. Maybe it's 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 about that the change the change will come from people understanding it and incorporating it into their work. They won't necessarily talk about it. I mean, my my, my vision is a, a little bit like you know, I'd, I'd like the Permaculture Association to become as irrelevant as the British Mathematical Association. Um, <laughs> No one needs a British Mathematical Association in order to um, sustain mathematics as a discipline in the UK. It's so well in, embedded in courses in, and so on that you don't need the Mathematical Association to take it forward. I, I'd like to see permaculture thinking as widely. I mean, basically, we're, we're, we're ecological beings on an ecological planet living system. At some point, we're all going to get eco-literacy. And, and understand how I was going to ask you, like, how, how has you talked about how it's embedded in some universities, which is absolutely fantastic. It's kind of infiltrated yeah. its way in there quite nicely. How how about in schools, in um, in uh, high schools or primary schools? Are there any permaculture programs yeah. that are? There are, and and but it's not not necessarily that explicit. There have there, there are there are individuals that take on permaculture and it, a, a, a rapidly increasing them because you know the great work that the children in permaculture project has done the books out there it's been you know thousands and thousands of copies have been sold lucy and her colleagues have done um 
training, how to become a, a, a children permaculture practitioner. People are using it in schools and nurseries and, and, and there's no doubt that it's out there. It's not been adopted by the mainstream education system. But the, the, the link there would probably be outdoor learning yeah. um, is, is probably the, the biggest area of potential for, for how it could kind of connect. Um, so it hasn't got kind of institutional backing, but it's got it's got kind of the backing off some teachers. So, again, you can see it sort of growing mm. and it will have an influence. And, you know, may, maybe in the future it will be called a regenerative curriculum or something. I don't know. Who, who knows? But I think it's if the influence is there. I mean, I think with all of this, for, for me, it, a lot of it comes back to how willing are we to spend some more time on the movement aspect of our work you know so chris warbson brown doctor our who was our research coordinator and still involved in the association he said um that permaculture is a globe, global movement for local change and we're really good at the local change bit but we're not very good at the global movement bit and you know we've we've been involved in a project called the Permaculture Collab. It was originally the next big step project, and now it's called the Permaculture Collab. It's we've had a couple of ch ch big challenges. One one is that people weren't used to working online. That's broadly changed now, so I think that's good. That's uh, that's one less big barrier. But the other one is that just having people that have capacity to also link to and connect at a global level with with, with we're not many mm. that are, are doing that so there's not many people but also because we've got this idea that it's all about local change there's not much inclination for people to step up and say well we're all local change makers but we're doing this in a global movement and if we were to actually spend some time maybe with our global communities of practice mm -hmm. oh how are you doing education work oh that's really interesting i could do that too yeah I think that's the kind of work where, you know, Ego Lemos, East Timor, permaculture in every single school. It's phenomenal. Yeah. Now, why isn't there a queue of people from every country in the world doing permaculture saying, Ego, how are you doing? How did you manage to make that happen? How could I have permaculture in my state education system in Argentina or Taiwan or, uh, you know, Mozambique or Wales? You know, that for me, if, if I'm very inspired by permaculture, I'm really super um, motivated and, and and still still want to kind of take it forward. If, but if, it, if, there's, if there's a frustration, it's that somehow we don't prioritise that next level of kind of collective organising. And, you know, I don't know if, if I don't know what um, attitudes are like in Australia, whether I can say the anarchist word, but, you know, I, I'm an anarchist. From my, if I have a political kind of um, philosophy that I would say I, I'm close to, and I look at all the political um, kind of philosophies available to me, I, I would go for anarchism because it's about self-organising. It's about not having power over people. It's about mutual aid. It's, 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 very much the the mode of permaculture by regional non-threatening you know it, it's about earth care people care fair shares it's not about kind of authoritarian structures which basically govern over us and tell us all what to do mm. Mm. i mean obviously mm. it's a long 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 process to get to a, a kind of utopian future uh we're not ready yet but <laughs> but that's i would aspire to a governance style where we can question people's authority. You know, people can question what I do at the Permaculture Association at any point. I very happily answer any questions and stand aside if I wasn't doing the right thing. So we can be self-organizing, but that doesn't mean to say that we can't create organizational structures which facilitate the things that we want to do. And I think we're very good at doing the self-organizing local stuff, but we've not been very good at doing the self-organizing global movement stuff. Mm, I think this is where I'm really inspired by them, by what the Perma Youth are doing right now. I really see them reaching out and stretching out globally and 
connecting intergenerationally, cross culturally. So um, the who? The perma youth. Oh, perma youth. Yes, absolutely. Very yeah. much. So you know, like I feel like that's a. They're coming at it from that point right from the very beginning. And yeah. um, and then kind of connecting up with local hubs and, you know, yeah. inspiring local hubs to form. But it yeah. is very much about that always coming back in together as this. They are basically a global community of practice and things Fantastic. are just sparking out of that. It's just phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. Well, but I, I totally agree with you. Like this, this idea, I'm, I'm so glad that we do now have far more um, acceptance of coming together online. And if we bring yeah. that together with the idea of having communities of practice, so, you know, we're coming together and having this chat, but if maybe all the people that I'm speaking with on this on these um, conversations were actually all together in the same room, that would be well, phenomenal. Let's organise it. Okay, let's do that. All right, I'm I'd up be, for that. I'd be very happy to help organise that. Great. I think all that right. would be a fantastic okay. thing to do. And it's, it, it's just about... I mean, there's so much can happen just from having a conversation. Absolutely. You know, it's, even if we just had some regular conversations, I think we could really push things forward. But yep. the idea of a collab <clears throat> quite simply was to say, look, the permaculture movement's growing really fast. It's growing all around the world. People have got all sorts of successes and all sorts of challenges. Bill put together this idea of having an international permaculture convergence every two or three years around the world. It's not viable now as a global movement to, to, to rest all of our kind of strategic thinking on an occasional event that happens somewhere where you have to fly to. No. That doesn't make sense of no. the opportunities in the world, which has got something called the internet. Yeah. And this so, is exactly too why why the Perma Youth decided that we're gonna um have a that we're gonna go to Argentina and interview people there and then beam them out into the world. And when Argentina didn't happen because of COVID, we thought, okay, we'll yeah. have a youth summit. And then we thought, hang on a tick, a youth summit means just all at one time, all in a few days and sitting for four days on a on the internet. Let's spread it out. Let's have yeah. a meeting a month. And so that's yeah. what's been happening ever since that got cancelled. And that gives this this ongoing conversation. Yeah. And I, I think, think we could right. do that as, as grown-ups as well. Exactly, exactly. I <laughs> totally agree. I'm, you know, really inspired by Perma Youth. And I think, <clears throat> I mean, they're not constrained by old thinking. Mm. You know, they just grow up with phones and computers and internet and friends all around the world. And that's that's normal. Yeah. And that's brilliant. That's the kind of, you know, but, but, very much we need to do for grown-ups need to get on board basically <laughs> totally agree with that yeah. and i think there's there's nothing wrong with having kind of in-person events that's fantastic too but we we, we can't rely on they, they can give a pulse of energy broadly we need to move to regional convergences you know we're, we're having european convergence in the, in um october and uh which will be online our carbon footprint will be way lower than it would be if we were to meet in person. And um, we'll have a lot, of, a lot of connection. And, yeah, hopefully that, that will energise the network. And then that will feed the conversations that we can have for the next two or three years before we have the next big event. Yeah. So I think the events have a, a role, but it's to stimulate the conversation that we can then have on a regular basis. And it's and, having and that regular like say, conversation afterwards. And, and I know that there's... Um, I know um, Hannah from Abundant Earth has been trying to get the the Weaver network happening yes. so that there's this online platform where you can have, like, forums and find who are all these people. So I'd love to see that happen. Yeah. I know she's still really yeah. keen to see that emerge yeah. as well. But so what Just um, what are some of the things that you'd like to suggest that people could tap into in terms of things that... Um, that you're organising, that you'd like to let people know about or um, okay. or things that you'd like to sort of encourage people to sort of step up and speak up about because, you know, like, this, like we've been talking about, it's, it's well, we need to change the world and permaculture is a possible way that we can be doing this and, and how do no you doubt. see us doing that? Well, I, I would say, I mean, I think, um, okay, so www.permaculture.org.uk. If you're in the UK, come and check out what we're doing. If you're not in the UK, borrow anything or take just, you know, use it. It's fine. 
Um, there's a great knowledge base. Um, there's loads of resources. YouTube's got millions of videos. I mean, basically, the world's when, when I first came across permaculture, it was like a secret society. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you were lucky, <laughs> you might happen upon a crumpled leaflet at the back of the cafe in, in you know, central alternative technology. Um, the world's awash with information about permaculture now. <clears throat> Pardon me, let me just get a glass of water. So, so there's no there's no shortage of information. <clears throat> I hope this isn't too strange a way to to um, suggest a way forward, but I, I think there's something about people really noticing where is their own passion? Where is their own curiosity? Where is their own enjoyment? What are the things that genuinely make them feel happy? What are the things that gen, what are the things they feel angry about? Actually, there's something about sort of like sort of listening to them, listening to ourselves because I'm absolutely just like just like we think you know you put you need to put plants in the right place they can't have too much sun or they need more sun or they can't have too much water or they need more water each plant has got its own needs and its own when those needs are met it creates the most beautiful flower and you know it couldn't be better and I think humans are the best just the same it's like we're all different we've all got our own role we've all got our own unique contribution and I wouldn't don't want anything more than each person just be the, the fullest expression of themselves so for me it, it's like okay earth care people care fair shares what is it in that big broad vision of the future a flourishing earth a flourishing community uh, a world where we're sharing and and we're, we're healing a lot of healing in that vision of the future where, where, where do you see yourself What's the contribution that you can make? What would what would give you most satisfaction? And then just, then just Google it. <laughs> you know, there'll be there'll be there'll be a community of practice. There'll be a forum. There'll be a group. There'll be loads of videos. There'll be a book to read. Talk to your friends. Ask, bit, share a conversation. What, write write out a plan. How can you learn that? It might be I'm really passionate about growing my own food. Great, grow a garden. Mm -hmm. I'm really. You know, You've got all the things there. Create superb soils. Make your garden. Grow abundant food. <laughs> grow a fruit forest. Okay. <laughs> there's there's so much we can do in our gardens. We might want to retrofit our homes and composting and uh, you know draft proofing. We I I, I did a, a course and um, you know our, our, our last permaculture course and someone realised that they were really really into retrofit. They're like. I, I did a bit of retrofit and I really, really love it. And they they want to change their career. So this was now, the open... last thing that I wanted to ask you about too. It's like, where do you see, you know, a lot of people talk about, well, I love permaculture, but, you know, it's, I just want to keep it as a hobby because I don't understand how I can make it my career. Like it, permaculture right. is my career and I know many people it's career. I, I'm assuming it's your career as well. Yeah. How can what are the suggestions you have in terms of actually embracing permaculture as a career? Like you find the passion that you have, but how so, do you how can permaculture so be your work as well as your yeah. life? I think there's 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 for me, there's there's permaculture as, as a practice. And so there's all the the, the, the kind of the, the the things about becoming a grower, um, you know, there's all the kind of practical sides of permaculture which which um you, you can learn them and you can you can you know yeah I guess be uh involved in so food production etc then there's the the the, the the kind of educators consultants designers more of a kind of consultant and supporting others to create their own systems then you've got the kind of world change um, organizing, networking, um, those kind of skills of being an organizer. But then there's so there's all the stuff which you might think of as the kind of permaculture jobs. But then there's a step out, and this is where it goes a bit like um, maths as a useful analogy, because there's lots of people that that use mathematics in all sorts of different jobs. They don't think of themselves as mathematicians, but they couldn't do their job without it. Mm. 
And I think, you know, we need we need carpenters that have done a permaculture training and they'd think about where the wood's coming from. They'd think about the kind of products that they make. They'd think about where the outputs go. We could we need we need people, permaculture people in retail. We need permaculture people in, in the police force. We, we need we need permaculture people putting on theatre performances and doing the arts. It's it'd be really deadly boring and actually not very effective if everyone was just doing doing the the a kind of well so i guess what i'm trying to say is for me it's a at its core permaculture gives us a really amazing set of values insights and skills which we can apply to every realm of human culture and so people might say well i'm really interested in permaculture as a hobby Great. So what's your main job? And how can you apply your permaculture thinking to your main job? So maybe you're working in an insurance company. How can you bring your permaculture thinking into the insurance company to say, OK, health care, people care, fair shares, ecological thinking, climate risks, et cetera, et cetera. How could we use this thinking to shift the way we work in our insurance? You know, so it's I think it's. For me, you can apply permaculture to pretty much anything. So, yeah, I, I yeah, right perfect. That's, I think that's I okay. think you know you're absolutely right, and it, it is because in many ways, like you said, it's a practice, but it's also a way of perceiving the world and perceiving yourself in relation to the world, and relation to everything that you do, yeah. and so taking that way of thinking the systems thinking the permaculture thinking and it, yeah whether you're in your neighborhood talking to your neighbors or whether you're um creating a new organization or whether you're yeah. educating your children or whether you, whatever and and we've often talked about this as you you know we go through the course but really i think unpacking this a lot more to talk about how we can apply it to you know every single aspect yeah whatever work that we're in and that, yeah, really yeah. opening up that potential to see permaculture is a skill for life and a skill for work and a skill for being a, being a radical activist, but in yeah. whichever way that that may, <laughs> may look and it doesn't have to be, you know, something that you might not normally engage with because you think, oh, that's a bit too radical, but in actual fact, just the simple act of thinking differently is a radical yeah. act and the shift in thinking is action in itself because it oh, absolutely ripples into everything that you do yeah i i think um where did i see the quote um thought is action you know that the way we think does change the way we we behave in the world and you know i was very one of my formative workshops the first permaculture convergence i ever went to was with them. Um, there was a woman there called Sylvia Eagle, who was one of the early pioneers of permaculture, founders in the UK. And she'd been really inspired by Bill and a lot of the work that he'd done with Indigenous people. And she was saying how one of the Aboriginal sayings is, you know, we sing and dance the world into existence. And she couldn't get her head around it. She's like, ah. Oh, I just can't kind of, what's it mean? How does it work? And I think she was she was on a tube station one day and she was kind of going down in the tube, you know, one of these big long escalators and there was all the sounds, you know, the, all the people and sounds and noise and motion. And then she just had this sort of phased out a bit and suddenly thought, well, if we didn't come down here and we didn't do this, the world would be different. It was, it was just had this moment where she realised that the way we talk, the way we move, all of our thoughts, all of our actions make the world what it is. And that's almost magical. It's almost like a sort of, it's almost like, wow, we've all got so much power. We've got so much power because everything we say and everything that we do can make a difference. Mm. And I think bringing that sense of attention and power to whatever we're doing Whatever context we're in gives us the opportunity for change. We've all got that possibility to heal the world. Absolutely. That's it's such a powerful way of seeing things. And I think the other thing that's really 
powerful that helps too is giving yourself permission to step up and speak up. Quite often we think, oh, it's the expert that does that or it's the leader or it's the person who's been doing it for decades and they they can stand up and speak up. But actually everybody everywhere can be the agents for change and and be the difference that makes a difference. And I think... They they can. And and it's so true, isn't it? It's like I've got a a friend who um, lived in East Germany, East German, and... um, before the the wall fell, and basically no one no one would mention anything. You know, everyone knew it wasn't working, but no one could speak. And it, when the wall fell, everything changed because the conversation changed and, and people could speak differently. And it was this process by it unlocked this potential to kind of challenge. And I think that's what's happening in the world now at the moment is we've got this basically fossil fuel driven capitalist system is literally killing the planet and people are starting to speak but people are speaking from all sorts of quite unusual places now the conversation's changing and it's that conversation changing which will lead us to it's part of what leads us to the different sort of world i mean it's the action too but it's what we say and what we choose to talk about and you know, even at the dinner table with friends, you know, what we're pushing it a little bit further and saying, well, what do we really think about that? Is that good enough? And change of my conversation is in itself something that all of us can do. Yeah. What's really valuable for us, what's what's important for us. Yeah. We can well, I think that's hours, a beautiful place to to um to close our conversation and and uh, imagine that we can uh open up a bigger conversation with people around the world. So I'm I'm dedicated to work on that and I'd so love to work on that with you. Fantastic. Yeah. That sounds really good. Yeah. Morag, I'd love to interview you, you at some point because you just do so much great work and I want to thank you for it. Oh, thank you, Andy. Yeah, no, you're real, real energy. It's great. Right. Well, thank you for your time today. And okay. um, it's just been an absolute delight to spend this hour with you and, um, yeah, I'm, I know we'll stay more in touch from now on, which is be great. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Take care. Thanks. Take Bye. Care. Bye. So that's all for today. Thanks so much for joining me. If you like a copy of my top 10 books to read, click the link below, pop in your email, and I'll send it straight to you. You can also watch this interview over on my YouTube channel. I'll put the link below as well. And don't forget to subscribe, leave a comment, and if you've enjoyed it, please consider giving me a star rating. Believe it or not, the more people do this, the more podcast bots will discover this little podcast. So thanks again, and I'll see you again next week.